Uh, tonight, I want to look at the, some of the foundational values and assumptions of Buddhism, trying to get back to something of where the Buddha is coming from in his teaching. And I want to do it by looking at one of the well-known discourses, the Kalama Sutta, which is quite well known, particularly in Western Buddhism, and is very interesting for giving a, having a, a look at where the Buddha is coming from, because in this discourse he teaches a non-Buddhist audience. So in Kalama Sutta, he's, he's teaching people who are not his students, and so he cannot assume that they agree with you know, what he's on about. They're not Buddhist. So it's, in a sense, it's an example of what he has to say to humanity at large, not simply Buddhists. And I'll just go through, uh, start reading the, the discourse and then, and then comment on it. And this is the beginning. Here is how I heard it. Once the Blessed One, while wandering in the Kosala country with a large community of bhikkhus, entered a town of the Kalama people called Kesaputta. The Kalamas thought, Venerable Gotama, a contemplative, a son of the Sakyans, has entered Kesaputta. Venerable Gotama has an excellent reputation which has been spread in this way. So indeed is this Blessed One accomplished, fully awakened, endowed with knowledge and conduct, sublime, knower of worlds, unsurpassed trainer of people with the potential for training, teacher of gods and humans, the awakened one, the blessed one. He proclaims this world with its gods, with Mara and Brahma, this world with its contemplatives and priests, its kings and peoples, having realized it with his own direct knowledge. He teaches a Dharma which is lovely in its beginning, lovely in its middle, and lovely in its end, in both, in both the spirit and the letter. And he displays the highest life, fully perfected and purified. Truly it is good to see such accomplished ones. Then the Kalamas went to the Blessed One. On arriving, some greeted him respectfully and sat down at one side. Some exchanged friendly greetings with him, and after polite conversation, sat down at one side. Some raised their join, joined palms to him and sat down at one side. Some announced their name and family and sat down at one side. Some remained silent and sat down at one side. So the setting is, is laid out. The Buddha is wandering around and he comes to the market town, uh, the, the town called Kesaputta, which is the capital of the Kalama people. Now, apparently Kesaputta um, was on a um, major crossroads, communication crossroads. And so a lot of people passed through. Now, in India at the time, of course, there were many teachers, spiritual teachers, but also, also non-spiritual teachers. For example, despite the reputation that India has for being very spiritual, at the time of the Buddha, there was a very large and flourishing school of materialists who were also wandering teachers. In fact, when we think about you know, more recent Indian religious traditions, we don't, we're not justified in assuming that the same sorts of things were going on at the Buddha's time. It was a very long time ago. So, for example, the belief in, um, in life after life. It's, this belief is widespread in India today, but it's quite possible that in the Buddha's time, it was not. The first time it's, it's mentioned in the Indian literature is in the Upanishads, and then it's mentioned as an esoteric secret teaching, so obviously not popular. It's quite possible that the Buddha's time, most people were materialists. Who knows? Uh, but there was certainly, there was a lot of many different schools of thought all contending with each other. It was a multi vibrant, multicultural society, people very interested in ideas and teachings and so on, and no established orthodoxy but you know, different, different teacher, teachers, in our terms, competing for market share. And the Buddha was one of them. So he comes to the town of Kesaputta, and then the Kalamas think, ah, well, this uh, venerable Gotama, Gotama, Siddhartha Gotama was his name. Gotama was his family name. Uh, venerable Gotama, a son of the Sakyans, he came from the Sakyan tribe, 
um, has an excellent reputation. And then you get the traditional praises of the Buddha. I'll just go through a couple of these. Fully awakened, enlightened, endowed with knowledge and conduct. Now, this, this is quite important. Knowledge, understanding, and conduct, action. Wisdom, ethics. In other words, there's, there's an intimate link between the understanding that is developed, so in the meditation practice, and the way one lives. They're not two separate enterprises. They're meant to be linked. And he's, dis he's described as, he displays the highest life fully perfected and purified. And again, this is his reputation. So he, he, he teaches a way which is involved both understanding and ethics, and he displays it. It's on show. Extraordinary lifestyle. He's, going, he's wandering around, and he's basically saying, do you want to know what full enlightenment looks like? Look at me. <laughs> uh, and living a very public life, uh, you know, in a, in a proverbial glass bowl. So he, he demonstrated what he was talking about. And this is, of course, very important, that he lived his teaching. He walked his talk. And, and uh, this is very important. In, if, when you go to Buddhist countries and you meet very respected monks and nuns, they live very public lives. They have very little privacy. My, most of my training was done at Mahasi Centre in Rangoon, which is a very large establishment. It's about 20 acres in suburban Rangoon. On a, on a normal day, uh, well, they, they, it's a meditation centre and they, they run one meditation retreat per year and it, and it goes for 365 days. <laughs> so you just kind of plug in. <laughs> and um, on a quiet day, they have about maybe 800 meditators. On a busy day, maybe 2,000. It's huge. I mean, a whole team of teachers, all, all of the monks, and yeah, all of the, no nuns, actually, come to think of it. But Upandita, was, he was my teacher, he was the head monk, so he was in charge. And he had this little house in, in, on the main street. And um, you'd walk into his house and nobody would ever knock. you just walk in. And when you walk in, the first room you're in is a kind of largish, like a living room. with his books on the wall and so on. And this is his reception room. He's got his chair up on one end and this is where he would give his talks, receive people and so on and so forth. If you kept going, you'd go enter into his study, which is a bit more private, and it was curtained off from the, the, the main room. Sometimes the curtain was open, sometimes closed. There he would study, relax, meet with smaller numbers of people. If from there you turned right, you were in his bedroom. And if you were in his bedroom and turned left, you'd be into the bathroom. And that was his, his little house. And people were constantly wandering in and out. And he, he, the man had no privacy. And it suddenly struck me one day. It's like how, what it would be to live like that. There's always people there, always. Monks, lay people, meditators, all sorts of people. Visitors from outside, politicians, generals, you name it. They all wandered in and out. And I reflected that the only place that he ever had privacy was in his bedroom. And I was telling this story actually in a, in a, in a retreat some time ago. And one of the meditators was a Burmese woman. Who, was who had practiced with him in, 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 with Upandita in Burma also. She came up to me later on and she said, actually, not even the bedroom. She said, one day I had a question and I walked in and he wasn't around, but he was having his nap. So I just walked into the bedroom and shook him and woke him up. Sorry, door, I have a question. <laughs> so, apparently not even there, <laughs> only the bathroom. But... You know, zero privacy. In other words, he could not get away with anything. Everybody knew everything that he did every day. To live under that kind of scrutiny and not go completely bananas, you have to be incredibly transparent. Like, there is nothing to hide. Nothing. And this is, this is the, the, the lifestyle that the Buddha himself modelled. Nothing to hide. Complete transparency. So it's, it's quite scary when you think about it. So 
the columnists uh, con contemplate his reputation and they say, truly it is good to see such accomplished ones. And so they go off and see him. Now, what uh, people used to do in those times, the local governments would set up Dharma centres outside town but within reach where visiting teachers could set up camp and they could live there and people could come and see them and you know they could hold teachings and gatherings and so on and so forth within reach of town. And these were open to anybody who would wander, wander around. And, and so there was this tremendous openness to an interest and curiosity in all sorts of teachings. It's hard to imagine governments in Australia, local or otherwise, funding centres of inquiry where anybody could come and do their thing and you know, people could come and, and check them out and participate. But again, it reflects what kind of society this was at the time. And then you get this description about the way that they greeted him. Some greet, um, on arriving, some greeted him respectfully and sat down at one side. Some exchanged friendly greetings with him and after polite conversation sat down at one side and so on down to some remained silent and sat down at one side. Why is there this obsession with the way people say hello? I think what it's showing is that there's, in these ways of saying hello, it's the hierarchy of respect from the most respectful to the least respectful. In other words, it's a mixed audience. It's not his audience. Some people are there because they, they feel a sense of reverence, and so they really want to sit at the feet of the master and hear the words and so on. Other people are there because there's no TV, there's no radio, and this is the, you know, the local amusement. And they, they're here to be entertained. A range of motivations for people being there. Not his people. The Kalama said to the Blessed One, there are contemplatives and priests, Bhante, who visit Kesabutta. They explain and clarify their own doctrines. The doctrines of others they despise, revile and pull to pieces. Other contemplatives and priests also come to Kesabutta and explain and clarify only their own doctrines. The doctrines of others they despise, revile and pull to pieces. Bhante, we are doubtful and uncertain about them. Who among these venerable contemplatives and priests spoke the truth? And who spoke falsehood? So this is the question that they throw at, at the Buddha. Sometimes when you read commentaries on this discourse, you hear the Kalamas described as simple village folk who are confused, and so they, they want clarification. These are not simple villagers. These are sophisticated urban intellectuals who have just laid a trap. They've laid it, now they're sitting back and they're waiting for the Buddha to fall into it. Because what, what can he say? It's a, it's, there's all sorts of competing truths out there, all sorts of competing doctrines. This is a world of competing truth claims and they are mutually exclusive. If you adhere to one particular doctrine, well, you don't adhere to the other. You think the others are wrong. It's a sophisticated multicultural society in which there is no universal orthodoxy but a whole number of competing religious, religions, religious and philosophical truth claims. Does it sound familiar? It's very much like our world. And what they've just bowled up to him is the problem of, we could say, religious or spiritual relativism. There are many doctrines. Which one is true? Could it be, uh, and they, say, they innocently say, well, each teacher who comes here says, as a matter of fact, my doctrine is true, and the others are false. So what do you say? Now, if he says, if the Buddha says, well, actually, they're all wrong, and I'm right, then he's just like all the rest. And you know, it's just yet another truth claim that can be filed away along with the, with the others. What can he say? Can he say, well, they're all true? or they're all false, or all paths lead to the same mountaintop, or whatever. You know, there's various answers to this problem. What, you know, what is the answer to this? Well, the Buddha sidesteps the trap, of course, and he approaches, it <coughs> he approaches the whole problem in his own particular way. And this is what he says. 
It is right, Kalamas, for you to doubt, to be uncertain. Doubt has arisen in an uncertain manner, in, a, in, a un, in an uncertain matter. So the first thing he does is say, doubt and uncertainty is a very good response to this situation. In other words, this is something that needs to be carefully investigated. Don't just jump in, but look and consider very carefully. And then he says, do not rely upon what has been acquired by repeated tradition, nor upon lineage, nor upon rumour, nor upon what is handed down in the teachings, nor upon logic, nor upon inference, nor upon a careful consideration of reasons, nor upon a delight in speculation, nor upon appearances, nor upon respect for your teacher. Kalamas, when you know for yourselves these things are unwholesome, these things are blamable, these things are censured by the wise, undertaken and observed, these things lead to harm and suffering, then abandon them. When you know for yourselves these things are wholesome, these things are blameless, these things are praised by the wise, undertaken and observed, these things lead to benefit and happiness, then attain and live them. So, the first thing he does is explain what cannot be relied upon. If you're looking for truth, what can you not rely upon? And basically, he cuts everything down, or most things. Uh, do not re rely upon what has been acquired by repeated tradition. Anusava, what has been heard, literally what is, has been heard along, what has been followed, the te um, has been followed along, what has been heard and followed. In other words, just because you've been raised in a particular tradition and everybody around you thinks that this is true, it doesn't mean that it is true. Maybe they're wrong. Nor upon lineage. Just because the teacher swans in and they're the, you know, the 15th Grand Poobah of the Supreme Exalted Order of Poobahs, uh, and they can trace their lineage over you know, 50 generations, and they've got all the trappings and, the, and, the, and that six-foot-high hat with the Grand Exalted Radiant Diamond in the centre of it, doesn't mean anything. You know, it just means they've got a job and a nice costume. But it doesn't necessarily mean that what they're saying is true. Maybe it is true, but how do you know? Nor upon rumour, obviously, nor upon what is handed down in the teachings. You know, just because this, uh, this, the word here is pitaka, which is also the word used f to refer to the Buddhist scriptures. So just because it's in the scriptures, just because it's in the sacred texts, everybody reveres these texts, they've been worshipping them for generations, that doesn't necessarily mean that what's in them is true. What it means is that these texts have been venerated for generations. That's what it means. It doesn't mean that what they say is true. And then he gets into, he puts the kibosh in much of the Western tradition, nor upon logic, inference, or a careful consideration of reasons. Now these are translations of three Pali terms which pretty much cover, what, broadly speaking, what we would call logic and reason. In other words, reasoning doesn't necessarily bring you to the truth. And it's obvious that, you know, from the point of view of logic, if, you're, if you, have a, you can have an impeccably logically correct argument, but if the premises are false, the result is false. Sometimes something is very rational, but it's wrong. Sometimes something is very irrational, but it's right. Just because it's rational doesn't necessarily mean that it's true nor upon a delight in speculation. If, he was, if the Buddha was teaching in the 21st century, I'd be tempted to think that he was having a go at academics. But there weren't any academics in his time. But people, or intellectuals, love to, to play with concepts. And they love to create you know, nice little systems, that, which look really good. Well, they might be very, look really, really good, but are they true? nor upon respect for your teacher. That's an interesting one, particularly in the Indian context, where the respect for the teacher is very important. And the Buddha himself was a teacher. So he's saying you can't even rely upon that. Then comes one of the most quoted sentences in Western Buddhist literature, 
Kalamas when you know for yourselves. And this is often cited in Western Buddhist literature to show that the Buddha was a good Western individualist. And it's actually amazing how many times this passage is misquoted. But what he says is, when you know for yourselves, these things are unwholesome, these things are blamable, these things are censured by the wise, undertaken and observed, these things lead to harm and suffering, then abandon them. When you know for yourselves, these things are wholesome, these things are blameless, these things are praised by the wise, undertaken and observed, these things lead to, to welfare and happiness, then attain and live them. So, first of all, the appeal to individualism, which is very strong here. When you know for yourselves, and it's, it's quite unambiguous, it's, it's a radical individualism. You know, we often think of the West as being the, the home of individualism. This is radically individual, individualist. Only I, can see the truth. No one can see it for me. Any, anybody's description of what it's all about is no more than somebody else's description. And that's just the nature of things. Either I see it for myself or I don't see it for myself. That's all. And this principle is, and you can see, guides this practice the appeal to the individual experience. And therefore, part of this is the need to be absolutely, impeccably clear about what your experience is. This is why we spend so much energy saying, OK, what is it exactly? That, that, don't get caught in the concept about it, but go deeper. What is it? Exactly what is the experience? Precisely what is going on? It's training to become clear about what, what is it that we know for ourselves. What do we know now? What's going on? So on the one hand, there's this appeal to individualism, but it's not just ideological. It has a practical imperative attached to it. If the only thing that I can rely upon is my own experience, then I have to be damn certain that I know what my experience is. And that's what this whole project of insight meditation is all about, to clarify the experience. No one can do this practice for us. No one can see what we see. I remember once, I was, when I was at Mahasya Center practicing, I was a monk at the time, and a, a friend of mine who was also a monk, uh, we were one day cheerfully breaking the silence and having a, having a chat. And we were talking about our ex meditation experiences. And, you know, we've both been meditating intensively for months. And, and I mentioned something, and I said, oh, but I, you know, I don't think it means anything because it only happened once and it was you know, really subtle. And my friend scolded me and he said, you can't do this practice without faith. And if you don't have faith, in your own experience, what the hell do you have faith in? And I realized he was right. It's like a lot of this stuff that happens is very subtle. If we don't have faith in our own experience, if we dismiss what we experience, oh no, it's probably not worth anything. Oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not an experienced meditator. So. Then we miss the point. We, if we're going to rely on our own experience, the first thing we need is to have faith in it. Like what it is, is what it is. In, at the Mahasi Center, the, 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 the Sayadors, the, um, the, the teachers, have, a, have their own peculiar way of instilling this faith. What they, would do, what they would do is, not necessarily all the time, but often, you go up and uh, you, you, in the interview, you report your meditation experience. And if you, if you reported something which was really significant and that they knew was really significant and that they could see that you thought it was pretty significant, then the response would be something along the lines of, you didn't see that. 
You were just imagining it. You were just thinking about it. And so you've got this, you know, the big authority figure who's literally sitting above you, kind of glowering down at you and saying, you didn't experience that, did you? And so the tendency is to say, oh no, I, I, I must have been mistaken. And, and if, you, if you say that, then it's, oh, yeah, stop imagining things and get out of here. But if you say, now wait a minute, I know what I experienced, and this is what I experienced, then the response would be, congratulations, welcome to the club. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like they would, they would really push it. If it was important, they'd really push it. And what they wanted, they, what they wanted to see was certainty was the determination that you could stand up and say, no, this is my experience. This is what I experienced. It's very important. It's absolutely central to, to the whole enterprise. And of course, experience is individual. One, one time, and, uh, one student was, went, to see, went to see Upandita and, and gave a very good meditation report. And um, Upandita nodded. And he said to him, who are you? And the student was somewhat taken aback. It's like, what's going on? What's this, this you know, Zen questioning coming, <laughs> happening here? And, uh, and he, you know, his mind spun furiously. And he said, uh, well, I'm not anyone. I'm just five aggregates arising and ceasing dependent upon conditions. <laughs> So he, he handed up an impeccably orthodox and correct <laughs> answer. And Upandita nodded in satisfaction. And he said, prove it. <laughs> and of course the guy, what can you do? <laughs> so he couldn't say anything. Interesting demand. I think what the, what the side always was after was an acknowledgement that you can't. You either know it or you don't know it. But if you know it, you know it for yourself. You can't prove it. You just know it or you don't know it. For the past few years I've been in a very desultory manner going back to the koans in the, in the Zen tradition and I told this story to my teacher and he was most dismissive of Upandita's if, if this would, of, of that kind of response. And he said, of course you can, well, he, he said something to the effect of, you can't prove it, but you can show it. And of course in Zen, that's, that's very much what you, you do. You demonstrate that. And that's a whole different style. But in, in both cases, in all cases, in all these contemplative traditions, you know it for yourself. And you either know it, and you know that you know it, or you don't know it. Since I'm just tossing in idle stories, I just thought of another one. Years ago, when I was a Zen student in Hawaii, uh, one time Anagatika Munindra was passing through town. Munindra was, he's, he died recently. He was an Indian man who practiced very deeply in the Mahasi um, approach to meditation. And he was uh, a significant teacher of the first generation of Western practitioners and, and teachers. He was the teacher of Joseph Goldstein and Sharon Salzberg, who went, subsequently went on to, to found the um, Insight Meditation Society in, at Massachusetts. He was passing through Hawaii, and I was practicing Zen. I was living, I was the, as the house manager at the, at the Zendo, and um, I heard about this, and I decided to go and visit him. And I was accompanied by uh, two other people, who follow Zendoids. And we went there, and it was this house, suburban house in Honolulu. And we're chatting away with uh, Munindra, and the, the, um, one, of the, one of the three of us, this particular fellow, dominated the conversation. And so it was basically a conversation between him and Munindra. And it was one of these ecumenical, you know, in Zen we do this, ah yes, in Theravada it's the same. And in Zen it's this, ah yes, in Theravada it's the same. Everybody ev agreeing with each other cheerfully and so on. And then it, the, um, the Zen person said, and in Zen the role of the teacher is, is really, really important because when the student has you know, the enlightenment experience, the teacher confirms it for the student and tells the student, yes, that's what it is. 
And at this point, Manindra just burst out laughing. And he said, in Theravada, the teacher doesn't tell the student. The student tells the teacher. <laughs> and I had no idea what he meant at the time, but I kind of filed that away. And years later, when I was in the Mahasi Center, I realized what he meant. It's the, it's the student who has the experience, and the student who communicates it, not the teacher. It's up to the student to do it. It's not up to the, to the teacher. So you have this appeal to a radical individualism and self-reliance that comes along with that. But you've also got something else. When you know for yourselves these things are unwholesome, these things are blamable, these things are censured by the wise. When you know for yourselves, these things are wholesome, these things are blameless, these things are praised by the wise. Suddenly, there's someone else involved. It's the vinyu, the wise. Also, blame and blamelessness have been introduced. Now, blame and blamelessness are both social. I mean, we can blame ourselves, but essentially blame is you need somebody else really, to blame. And suddenly we've got the mention of the wise. Who are they and where do they come from? You get this term in the, in the teachings, the vinyu, which, which you know, literally translates as the wise, those who know. And the wise are never defined. It's never actually clear who they are. If you're a Buddhist, it's quite clear who they are. They're the enlightened you know, beings, the enlightened people, uh, looked up to in your tradition. But if you're not Buddhist, who are they? The Buddha is, assuming, is, is making an assumption about the nature of society, which tells us a lot about society in his time. He's assuming that his audience, who he doesn't know, and who are not <coughs> his followers, so he, does, he can't assume that they think he's one of the wise. He assumes that every community has people that they look up to, and with respect, as these are wise people. And, these, and the opinions of these wise people is really worthy of consideration. And it's, it's really worthwhile consulting them and listening to what they have to say. And he just, the Buddha simply assumes that if you live in a community, you have such people. And of course, our situation is quite different. Who do we as a community, as a society, look up to as the wise? Who fulfills that role for us? There were very few, really. It used to be, you know, doctors and clergy and and so on, but they don't, they can't perform that role anymore. They've, the institutions have somehow been too discredited. It's very rare individuals that that manifest in that role. When anybody in public life seems to to manifest in that role, they in, become instant media celebrity because it's, there's this enormous hunger to have people who are like this, who you can, who can, who can look up to and, and respect. In Western Buddhism, of course, you get people like the Dalai Lama and Thich Nhat Hanh. They obviously fulfill that, that role. One of the problems that we have is a dearth of the wise. We don't have many. So anybody that we do have who could possibly fulfill that role is, is very valuable, worth their weight in gold, as they say. But the Buddha simply assumes that such people are available. So he's saying it's, it's not just individual. There's a social dimension. Yes, it's individual, but the individual exists in a social context, in society, in community. So you can see, for example, with this practice, this practice is radically individual. Each one of us is doing their own practice for themselves. No one can do it for anybody else. You can set up the conditions, but it's up to each one of us to do it or not do it, as the case may be. But not one of us in this room would be even attempting it without the support of the others. You know, there's a community of people who set the retreat up, who went to all the trouble to get the venue, get the, all the stuff you know, send out the registrations, organise the money, make sure that everything's here, work out, plan it all out, set up the managers each day, and so on and so forth, invite the teacher, pay for the fares. 
without community, it wouldn't happen. And then, even there, if you think about your experience here, if you, if you rolled in to do a one-week retreat, great facilities, it's all laid out for you, food's being served three times a day, and you walked in and you discovered you're the only person here. You're on your own. <laughs> How much meditation would you do? <laughs> it's the fact that everyone's here doing it generates this, this, this atmosphere that, it, that makes it so much easier for each one of us to do our individual thing. So, meditation is private, personal, subjective, and public, social, intersubjective, both. And without that public dimension, that intersubjective dimension, there could not be meditation because, apart from anything else, it could not be taught. How can you teach something which is radically individual? Unless there's something in common, there can't be any communication, so there can't be any teaching. So community, so meditation is always a community activity. So yes, there's this appeal to the individual, but there's the assumption that the individual works within a vibrant community of, of mutual help and support. And without that, it's, nothing's going to happen. In a society like ours, which is radically materialist and secular, it's particularly important that people who are engaged in what in the Buddhist tradition is called Dharma help each other and, and, and form community and create it as, as much as possible. Because without it, it can't, nothing can happen. It can't flourish. It can't put down roots. When you know for yourselves these things are unwholesome, these things are blamable, these things are censured by the wise, undertaken and observed, these things lead to harm and suffering, then abandon those things. Alternatively, when you know for yourselves these things are wholesome, these things are blameless, these things are praised by the wise, undertaken and observed, these things lead to welfare and happiness, then attain and live them. Now, the, what the Buddha is talking about is what we could call the fundamental ethical choice that all of us are faced with, the choice between what he calls the wholesome and the unwholesome. The terms here are kusala, wholesome, and akusala, unwholesome. And these are key terms in Buddhist ethics, the Buddha's um, assumption of how, what life is based upon. Something is kusala, oh, and kusala, akusala is often translated skillful, unskillful. In fact, I think usually translated skillful, unskillful. There's no exact English equivalent because they have a, a twofold meaning. Kusala means both wholesome and skillful. Something is wholesome if it is good within itself and needs no justification, no further justification for it. Something is unwholesome if it is bad within itself and just cannot be justified. So something is wholesome if it's good within itself. Let's take meditation practice. Let's say that we have an experience where we're really completely present, really just here. And then later on, we're, perhaps we're talking to people and they say, so what did you do last week? Oh, I you kind of said, so, oh, well, I kind of sat around and went for walks. <laughs> groping for the right words to explain it. And then you started to talk about it. And they might say, well, what did you do that for? You know, what good was that? And what they want is the justification for it. But if you reflect on, on a, a, an experience where you're just really just completely present with something, you might think, well, it wasn't good for anything. It was just good. Okay, it might be useless, but I don't care. It's just good. In other words, we're saying it's wholesome. 
that has that, that, that quality of wholesomeness. Alternatively, if something is, is bad within itself, so for example, for the Buddha, the Brahma Viharas, love, compassion, joy, equanimity, these things are wholesome. They are good within themselves. They need no justification. They're just good within themselves. Whereas aggression, anger, hatred, and so on, are bad within themselves. It's obvious that these are not good. So wholesome, unwholesome, and then skillful, unskillful. That which is skillful or unskillful leads beyond itself to something else. It has direction. Something is skillful if it leads to something else which is desirable. It, efficient is, is a very close term in our culture. Something is skillful if having this or doing this it leads to a desirable result. In other words, it, it points beyond itself. Something is unskillful if it leads to a bad result. So that which is wholesome is good within itself and it has direction. It leads to something good. In, and the Buddha expresses it in terms of undertaken and observed, these things lead to welfare and happiness. What is it that leads to our own welfare and happiness and the welfare and, and happiness of others? The unwholesome, undertaken and observed, these things lead to harm and suffering. So his ethics is essentially consequentialist. He's looking at actions and their results. What happens when I do this? What's the consequence? What does it feel like within itself? That's an important indicator of what's going on. For example, aggression. Is it comfortable or is it painful? Um, love. Is it painful or is it comfortable? looking at something within itself and then asking, and what's the result? What does it lead to? What happens if I indulge in this? So it's a very dynamic sense of, of ethics, learning to monitor experience to see the things that I do, the choices that I make, what are the results? And of course, this is very closely linked to what we were talking about early in the retreat, Sampajanya, clear understanding. There, we were talking about it simply in the context of the meditation practice, monitoring the meditation experience. But we learn to do that in the meditation, at the, at, as it were, at the microscopic level, but in terms of ethics, it's really the same process, but at a more general level. How do I live? What are the choices that I make? And what's the consequences of those choices? In order to make these decisions, I need to be awake and watching and tracking what's going on. Because, as the Buddha says, when you know for yourselves. But the problem is, we don't, do we? We're deluded. We're constantly making mistakes. We're constantly chasing things that we think will be good for us, but they turn out not to be. We constantly force people to do things for their own good, and then we realise with horror later on that they weren't. We're deluded. So, when you know for yourselves, carries with it a challenge. Do we know? And if we don't know, shouldn't we be investigating to find out? So again, you get this emphasis on examining experience, but examining it intelligently, examining it with, the, with in terms of cause and result. I do this, what happens? What's the result? And therefore, was that really a good thing to do? This monitoring, we, we practice in the meditation, we're constantly monitoring the experience and, and adjusting it. And in the broader ethical sense, which is what the Buddha here is talking about, looking at the way that we live, in a um, critical in the sense, not negative sense, but critical in the sense of um, not taking anything for granted, but really examining and investigating what's going on. Then the Buddha, he asks the Kalamas about greed, hatred and delusion. He says, what do you think, Kalamas? Does greed appear in a person for his, uh, his welfare or harm? For his harm, Bhante. And the Buddha says, being given to greed and being overwhelmed and mentally defeated by greed, 
This person takes life, steals, commits sensual misconduct and lies and prompts another to do the same. Will that result in his long-term harm and suffering? Yes, Bhante. And so greed, hatred, delusion. What do you think? Does the, do, are these unwholesome? Do these lead to harm and suffering? And they, yes. What do you think? Does non-greed or anti-greed appear in a person for his welfare or harm for his welfare, Bhante? And so on. You have the three akusala mula, the roots of the unwholesome, usually translated greed, hatred and ignorance, that could be translated as attraction, aversion, delusion. These are the three basic movements of the mind. Attraction is the movement of the mind towards something, to hold on to it. Aversion is the movement away from something, to resist or escape it. Delusion has a twofold nature of both not knowing what the experience is and therefore a confusion about what to do about it. So, oscillating between the two possibilities, what, don't want. Chomp, 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 chomp. Chom. And from these akusala mula, roots of the unwholesome, come all the, what we call the negative emotions and the, uh, uh, the obsessions and so on and so forth. Their opposites are expressed in a negative term, non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion. Uh, but the non here is, is in Pali, is quite strong. It's, it's, it's not just not, but the opposite, anti-greed. So anti-greed would be uh, uh, renunciation. Renunciation not in the classical sense of necessarily you know, wearing hair cloth and heading off into the forest, but having a relationship to desire which is not driven by obsession and addiction non-hatred, love, compassion, and so on, uh, non-delusion, wisdom, understanding, and so on. The Buddha keeps asking, what do you think, Kalamas? How does it seem to you? Now, of course, in the discourse, it's all laid out in a very mechanical way, a formulaic way. But what it's communicating is the Buddha is, is, keeps throwing it back onto the experience of, of the people. What do you think? How, is it, how does it seem to you? So again, it's, he's throwing it back on the individual. Uh, you look, you investigate. How do you see things? Anyway, they, they agree with him. And the Buddha goes on to teach them a meditation practice. And this is what he teaches them. A student of the Noble Ones, Kalamas, who is without greed, hatred or delusion, who is clearly understanding and mindful, lives pervading one quarter with a mind of love. In the same way, she lives pervading the second, the third and the fourth, so above, below, around and everywhere, and to all as to herself. She lives pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with love, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility or affliction. She lives pervading one quarter with a mind of compassion, with a mind of joy, with a mind of equanimity. In the same way, she lives pervading the second, the third and the fourth, so above, below, around and everywhere, and to all as to herself. She lives pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with equanimity, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility or affliction. So he teaches them the Brahma Viharas, the um, sublime states or the divine abidings, love, compassion, joy, equanimity. Now, notice again, these, are, these people are not Buddhists. So for the Buddha, the sublime states represent fundamental human values. Not, there's nothing specifically Buddhist about them. They're just universal, fundamental human values. Love, compassion, joy, equanimity. You don't have to be a Buddhist to recognize that these are good things and, and should be cultivated. All of them uh, are based on, on love, metta. Uh, love here is the desire for the welfare and happiness of the person. You notice how the Buddha sends it out to all the four quarters, all the, all the directions. So universal love, uh, not being stuck with any one particular person or group. Compassion is love directed towards those who are suffering and in pain and it presents as the desire to relieve their suffering. Joy 
is love directed to those who are happy. And it presents as, as a gladness and a delight in their happiness. And in one's own, of course. Equanimity is balance and impartiality. This is seeing all beings, and one, including oneself, as equally subject to happiness and to pain, equally subject to the results of their actions, of the way that they live. The key one, of course, being the first, metta, love. And i just just quickly point out, again, coming back to the social aspect of the, of the Dharma. The word metta comes from the word mitta, friend. So metta could also be translated as friendliness. Now, what do we mean by friendship? Often in, in this culture, when people are asking about the how the Dharma relates to ordinary everyday life. One of the basic questions that comes up again and again and again is how does it work in terms of personal relationships or intimate relationships? Now when people talk about relationships in, in, in this culture, invariably what they mean is sexual relationships. This to us seems to be the central kind of human relationship, you know, often called the intimate relationship. Friendship for us, is a kind of diluted form. It's not quite as important as what we call intimate relationships. <laughs> Friendship is more a diluted form of intimacy, a kind of a second best to what we call love. Now, this is quite different from where the Buddha is coming from. In, in the classical Indian tradition and in the classical European tradition, but not in modernity, the core relationship is friendship. <coughs> the fundamental relationship is friendship. It's friendship which enables a sharing, a true sharing between people. Of course, in traditional societies, for example, marriage isn't based on love. It's a social arrangement based on property, uh, making a living, <coughs> you know, running the farm, and so on and so forth. The key relationship in the Buddha's time was friendship. The, the way of life that the Buddha himself lived with his monks and nuns, he called the Brahma Charya. Charya means going in the sense of you know, how are you going, the, your one's way of life. Brahma means divine, spiritual, or the highest. So the Brahma Charya is the highest life, the highest form of life that there is. And one time the Buddha's attendant, Ananda, said to the Buddha, he said, I, I just realized that fully one half of the highest life is good friendship. And the Buddha rebuked him and said, you've got it absolutely wrong. Good friendship is the entirety of the highest life. Now, the very essence of the life that the Buddha lived was friendship, good friendship. Friendship for the Buddha was so important that he once said that his, his teaching is for people who have good friends and good companions. It's not for people who don't have good friends and good companions. And it's, you think about it, that's a pretty radical thing to say. What he seems to be saying is that the Dharma is like a medicine. It can cure you know, the fundamental sickness. But medicine only works given appropriate supporting conditions. And one of the, the necessary supporting conditions for the medicine of the Dharma to work is good friendship. It doesn't work if we're on our own. We must have friends. So the Buddha sees friendship as so important that what he teaches can't work without it. And his, the way of life that he developed for himself, you know, the monastic way of life, the whole thing was based on the cultivation of friendship and an expression of that. Uh, the Buddha himself, of course, was the model of the good friend, the Kalyana Mitta, because his, his relationships with, with others was based solely on desire for their welfare. And what is a friend? A friend is someone who cares for us and who, for whom we care. So caring is, is really central. The people for whom we care and, and who, who receive our care and know that they receive our care and therefore naturally return it. These are our friends. 
and this is our community. So caring, mutual support is, is crucial. And of course we can see it in the running of any meditation retreat, that it's a group activity and every, you know, everybody contributes. So for the Buddha, friendship uh, is, is fundamental to the whole project. Then the Buddha finishes off, he says, a student of the noble ones, Kalamas, who has such a mind, free from hatred and malice, undefiled and purified, finds four comforts here and now. If there is another world, and there is a fruit, a result of actions done well or badly, then at the breakup of the body, after death, I shall arise in a blissful, heavenly world. This is the first comfort she finds. So, if we act in an ethical manner, if we live ethically, if we cultivate love, compassion, joy, equanimity, the values based upon friendship, if we live well, what are the comforts that we will find? The first thing is that if there is another world and there, there is a fruit, a result of actions done well or badly. Now what the Buddha is talking about here is karma. Karma and its results. If there is another world, if there is life after life, then at the breakup of the body, after death, I shall arise in a blissful heavenly world. So if we do the right thing, we're going to heaven. This is the first comfort that we can find if we live well. If there is no other world and no fruit, no result of actions done well or badly, then I keep myself peaceful, loving, calm and happy. This is the second comfort she finds. Now you notice that in other words, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you believe in it or not. The Buddha did believe in life after life. I mean, for him it was a given. But he recognised that other people don't necessarily. But he's saying, but look at the way you live. Even if there is no other world, uh, no heavenly reward, then nevertheless, you keep yourself peaceful, loving, calm and happy. So, is that a good thing or not? <laughs> so, it's, it's, it's very pragmatic. It's, and again, it's looking at the results of action. I choose to live in a certain way. What's the result of that? And the reward, or the result, comes in this life just as much as any other. If evil consequences befall one who is evil, and I intend evil to no one, how can suffering affect me who does no evil? This is the third comfort he finds. This is essentially a restatement of the first. It, it, to, to be meaningful, it assumes that you believe that there is some kind of moral order in the universe, which we could call Dharma, which, <coughs> if we live badly, we will cop bad consequences sooner or later. But of course, a lot of people don't believe that there is such a moral order in the universe. So for these people, this third comfort would not apply. If evil consequences do not befall one who does evil, I see myself purified in any case. This is the fourth comfort she finds. So even if it, there isn't a bad result, still I'm purified, clarified myself. And so I lead a good life. So again, this, this, this pragmatic appeal. And the Kalamas respond, Excellent Bhante, excellent. It is as if one was to set upright what had been knocked down, or to uncover what is concealed, or to point out the way to one who is lost or to carry a lamp in the darkness, so those with eyes could see what is there. So has the Blessed One set forth the Dharma in many ways. We go to the Blessed One for refuge, to the Dharma for refuge, and to the community of bhikkhus for refuge. Bhante, may the Blessed One regard us as lay followers who have gone for refuge for life from this day on. So the discourse ends happily with everybody being converted. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, it's interesting that the Buddha's role is to uncover what is concealed or to point out the way to one who is lost. That is the Buddha's role. And, and that's why he's, he's so revered in the tradition. Uh, because he, through what's been passed on through, through, through the generations, he's still having that effect, uh, even today, even though he's dead two and a half millennia. Okay, that's enough for tonight. Thank you. <laughs>